Thank you, Master. <clears throat> How's everybody today? Amen. It's good to see you back in presence, John. Healed and delivered by Jesus, the King of glory. He makes a way where there seems to be no way. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory. Would you turn to the book of Daniel chapter 3? Yes, God is good. Daniel 3. Everybody there? <laughs> Are you refreshed? If you didn't get refreshed, you got refleshed. <laughs> Hallelujah. Daniel 3 and verse 1. Let's speak it together. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, he made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width 60 cubits. He set it up in a plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Of course. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to dedicate the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Hello, does that sound familiar? A little parallel with the book of Revelation? Yeah. So the satraps and the administrators and governors, the counselors and the treasurers, the judges and magistrates and all the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image of that king Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a uh, herald cry aloud, to you it's commanded all peoples, nations and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, psaltery, and the symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of burning, fiery furnace. Nice, huh? Now go to verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the cause, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the expression on his face changed toward Shadrach, Meshach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than its usual heated. Now listen, when a person gets delivered and spirits leave them, how many come back? Seven times. Hello. Oh, glory, we're getting somewhere. Verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king, 
Look, he answered, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Or what he meant was like an angel. Then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. <laughs> His tune changed, didn't he? <laughs> oh, snap. <laughs> then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the midst of the fire. And the satraps, administrators, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together, and they saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. The hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his what? Angel. And delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word. And yield their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except for their own god. Therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces. And their houses should be made as ash heap because there is no other God who can deliver like this. <laughs> and what happened? Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of where? Babylon. In where? Babylon. What's ruling this earth? Babylon. But see, it's important to understand that they had no idols. Amen? <laughs> they were submissive. They were obedient. They were protected from the spirits that attempt to re-enter. They were protected from all fiery trials of the enemy. Why? Because of their submission and obedience. Their hearts were set towards the Lord. See that fiery furnace is the area to where they were not touched. They didn't smell. They did nothing. I've given this testimony before about a pilot. He was a helicopter pilot. And he had backslidden. And he was flying. And he lost engines and hydraulics in his helicopter. Well, a helicopter can auto-rotate down. And as it was falling out of the sky, he kept going, oh, dear God, help me. Have mercy upon me. You know, a lot of prayers come out in that circumstance. He had enough time to repent, probably about a thousand times. And the plane crashed. And it was on fire. He had broken his collarbone. He couldn't get out. He was strapped in. And he looked, and there was an angel of the Lord blowing on him. And he passed out. He woke up in the hospital. And when he got up, and they told him that they had to do surgery on his shoulder and this and that, and whatever, and reset it. He said, what happened? He said, you know what? We don't understand. But you were in a mist of fire. And we didn't smell no smoke on you at all. In fact, one of the firemen had to get brought in because a fire hit him. And he went to the Lord and he said, why, Lord? Why did you rescue me? And the Lord said, because of the prayers of the saints that were protecting you. And because basically your heart had showed repentance. See, when he saw the angel of the Lord blowing on him, he saw the Lord Jesus behind him at a distance. Let me tell you, when you're right in position with God, you're protected him no matter what the fiery trial is around you. No matter what's going on, you won't be touched. You may feel like you're being touched, but you ain't going to die. It's just the die to yourself. Amen. Now we know that the world is going through what I want to call is the burn. Everyone say the burn. 
And that's what we're going to talk about today because, see, there is what we call the burn that is happening. In Acts chapter 9. Oh, glory. In verse 1. The world is in the burn. <laughs> and everybody, uh, anybody ever hear the saying, uh, uh, what is it, as the world turns? You know, that uh, soap opera thing, it's as the world burns. Acts chapter 1, verse 1, let's speak it. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from them, to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found anyone who were of the way of any believers of Jesus Christ, any followers, whether men, women, or children, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem so they can be persecuted, executed, and imprisoned. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. You know, I believe that the disciples were praying for this man. Or they might have been praying some other prayers, like kill him, get him out of the way, do something with this man, Lord. He's chasing us down and destroying your church. I believe God answered the prayers of the saints here. <laughs> and again, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, suddenly a light shone around him from heaven, and then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why? Because he was persecuting the church, his body. Then he said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? <laughs> I talk about complete surrender there. Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who were journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. And Saul arose from the ground. When his eyes were open, he saw no one. He was blinded. But they led him by hand and brought him into Damascus. He was there three days without sight and neither ate or drink. God put him on a three-day fast. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias and to whom the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise, go to the street called Straight and inquire of the house of Judas. For one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying like he's never prayed before. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hands on him so that he might receive his sight, transfer the anointing. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many people about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. Now this next sentence is vitally important. For I will show him how many things he must what? Suffer for my name's sake. <laughs> that word suffer is associated with reaping. Reaping. How much he must reap for what he has done. Does everybody get it? That reaping is an area where God teaches us and trains us, where we learn that suffering. It's called the burn. So he said, I'm going to bring Paul into the burn. The what? The burn. And he must suffer. He must burn because of what? His reaping. See, people don't realize that God forgives you, but your reaping does not stop. You will, every one of us will reap what we sow. If you reaped into evil and sin, you will reap it. I mean, if you sowed into it, you're going to reap it. Even when you repent, you still have to reap. Nobody escapes the reaping. Nobody. Some of us are still reaping. I'm sure we're all, and then what we did last week, we're still reaping. But God uses it to turn to the good. 
See, if any one of us was perfect, he couldn't do it. Is everybody okay? Galatians 6. Galatians 6, verse 7. Galatians 6, verse 7. Let's speak it. Do not be what? Deceived, blinded, stupid. God's not going to be mocked. For whatever man sows, he's going to what? He's going to reap it. For he who sows to the flesh will reap what? Corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap what? Everlasting life. He says, let not your, let us not grow weary while doing good. In other words, maintain doing good. Keep sowing in the spirit. For in due season, you're going to outrun the reaping. And you, as long as we don't what? Lose heart. Don't give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to the, those of the household of faith. Sowing and reaping. Sow to rebellion, you reap suffering. It's called the burn. Without sowing into corruption, you can't get into the burn. Why well, repented multiple times? It doesn't matter. You're forgiven, but you're going to reap. Amen? You're still going to reap no matter what. People are constantly recycling and reaping sickness, disease, infirmities. All of these things is because of what they've sowed. Does everybody get it? The enemy can't touch you if you would not sowed in the flesh. You would be perfect. Amen? Does everybody get it? But God's going to use it to the good. That's called the what? The burn. Welcome to the burn. Jeremiah 17. If you sow in the Spirit, you're going to reap life. Jeremiah 17. Hallelujah. In verse 5. Jeremiah 17, verse 5. You know, I forgot what I was doing something yesterday. And all of a sudden, I heard the voice of the Lord say, the burn. I think, wow. I thought something was burning. I didn't know what was up. In fact, I went upstairs. I was walking upstairs in my, uh, in my, uh, upstairs in my house. And I smelled something burning. And I, I realized it was coming from my daughter's room. I'm thinking, oh, hallelujah. I opened the door and her friend was there. Well, and her and her friend were there. And her, she works at a uh, barbecue small place. <laughs> and she just came out of work and she was in that room. They all snap. There was the burn. <laughs> there was that smell. <laughs> I thought, oh, I guess that's not what you're talking about, Lord. <laughs> Verse 5, thus says the Lord God Almighty, cursed is the man who trusts in man. Now listen, curse means burn, suffer. When you put your trust in yourself and all your own abilities and talents and the things that you think have got to be done right, you will bring a curse, the burn. Amen? It doesn't mean you're going to hell means you're going to burn here, right now. The burn is within. It says, Cursed is a man who trusts in man and makes his flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. See, people don't realize that your heart will depart from the Lord when you trust in you. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes. Why? Because when God's trying to do something, they miss it. They're too caught up in self. And they, sometimes they get caught up in their own burn. <laughs> 
but shall inhabit the parched places of the wilderness and assault which is not inhabited. But what? Blessed life, favor, abundance is a man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. He shall be like a tree planted in the waters which spreads out its roots by the river. It will not fear when he comes, but its leaf will be green and won't be anxious. Anxious. See, if you're anxious and you're trusting in you, you will be at peace. Will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. The heart of it is deceitful above all things. What's the heart? It is the core of all desires. And desperately wicked, who could know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give to every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. How? In the burn. Everyone say the burn. Oh, snap. <laughs> Psalm 1. I didn't say someone, I said someone. <laughs> the burn. The burn. When I heard the word the burn, I mean there was a download that came that I couldn't even catch it all. You know, he brings what he wants to remembrance, and then it's something that can be searched out more. In verse 1, would you read it with me? Psalm 1, 1, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Well, is your old man the ungodly? Amen. So that means you're, if you're, you're blessed if you don't walk according to the counsel of your own understanding. Amen. But if you do walk in the counsel of the flesh, you are what? Cursed. Amen. That means you will get the burn. Nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seats of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord or his truth. And, he, and in his law, he meditates. That means he focuses. Day and night. You know, focus. If you focus on something, it's sight. Somebody get it? It's sight. We're going to talk more about this at another time. Because there's a lot of things getting re released. Hallelujah. Is everybody okay? He, he focuses on it day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water and brings forth its fruit in, se in its season, whose leaf also sound not wither, and whatever he does shall what? Prosper. Praise God. Blessed is the individual that takes the counsel of the Lord and curse who does not. Again, that just brings a person into a, a reaping process for what? The burn. God will use all of our reaping for the burn for what? Training. Amen. That's what it's about. You can't be trained without the burn. Hebrews 12. That's why we're to be a flame of fire, right? We're in a constant burn. <laughs> but it, <laughs> Hebrews 12 and verse 3. Let's speak it. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet restricted, resisted to bloodshed and striving against sin, and you have forgotten. The exhortation which speaks to you as to sons and daughters. My children, my sons and daughters, do not despise the chasing of the Lord. That's a burn. That is the burn. God doesn't chasten without the burn. Nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure the burn, <laughs> God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten or burn? But if you are without chastening or the burn, of which all have become part, all, I'm going to say all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not a son. Furthermore, we've had human fathers who corrected us. We paid them respect, shall not we, shall not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live. 
For they indeed for a few days chasten us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of what? His what? His holiness. Again, here, here, this is what he's saying. Listen, I want you to be partakers of my true character. Without the burn, you can't be. Because these things are burning out the old. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful, but for the present, but what? It's painful. Sickness is painful. Hello? Rejection is painful. Offense is painful. These things are all painful. They're inward painful. They're burning. Groanings are painful. Nevertheless, after it yields the peace about fruit of righteousness to those who have been what? Trained by it. Again, we are trained by sufferings. We, God brings us into what we call the burn. He allows this to happen. Why? Because we're not perfect. But he's making us perfect. In him we're perfect. Amen? Oh, hallelujah. Chasing in his suffering of the burn. <laughs> What's he trying to do? Reach us the ability to partake of his holiness. That is his true character. Psalm 24. In verse 3. Who may what? Ascend into the hill of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place or in his presence. He who has what? Clean hands and a what? Pure heart. Well, how's God going to manifest a pure heart with us without going through the burn? How are we going to get clean hands without going through the burn? Who has not lifted up his soul to an idol? Wow. Wow. He's trying to burn all those idols in our lives. False fulfillments, false desires. Wrong things that are displeasing to God. Nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessing from the Lord. The righteousness from the God of his salvation. This Jacob, the generation of those who what? Seek him and who seek his face. We need to have clean hands and a pure heart. So that we can be partakers of his holiness or of his character. It's trained by the burn. It's trained by the what? The burn. Second Corinthians 7. Verse 9. Second Corinthians 7 verse 9. Hallelujah. Now rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to what? Repentance. Do you remember doing something stupid? Oh, yeah, I don't want you to remember it all, you know, I'm just. <laughs> you know you did something and you, you made a mistake and you, man, you know, you knew it was offensive to the Lord. You might not have thought it at that moment because of either anger or frustration or whatever or desire. And then afterwards you realize, man, it was, uh, that was wrong. A, a burn comes in. It's an inner grief. It's like, gosh, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I'm still doing it. I can't believe, does somebody get it? I can't believe I'm still acting that way. I can't believe, there's an area where I can't believe I'm still doing this. And then inside, there's a sorrow. There's a true repentance. It is a burn. If you haven't reached it, then you haven't reached true repentance yet. Hallelujah. Now listen, for... Uh, for now I rejoice that you were made sorry, but uh, your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in the godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces what? Repentance leading to what? Salvation. Not to be regretted, but that the sorrow, sorrow of the world produces what? Death. See, many people are still grieving over the worldly possession losses. They're still grieving over all the things of their past. They're still grieving over la past relationships. Only if what's and what and this and that. 
Those are all open doors to the burn. For observe this very thing that you soured in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourselves. What indignation. What fear. What vehement desire. What zeal. What vindication. And all these things you proved yourselves to be what? Clear in this matter. Therefore. Although I wrote to you, I did not do it for the sake of him who had done the wrong, nor for the sake of him who suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear to you. Hmm. Again, there's that inner burn of grief and sorrow. What's it producing? It's going to produce righteousness. It's going to allow you to eventually reach a level to partake of the holiness of God's character. 1 Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6. If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of good doctrine, which you have carefully followed. But reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself towards godliness. For bodily exercise profits little, but godliness prof is profitable for all things, having the promise of life that now is and, and at that which is to come. Now listen. When people exercise, this is a wonderful example. Nothing changes until you reach a burn. That's when you know there's an exchange. You work out, you work out, you can, you can run, you can do leg exercises. It doesn't matter. You feel a burn. Whether it's chest, arms, legs, especially in the legs and tender areas and shoulders. Man, you'd be doing stuff and all of a sudden you feel a burn. That's when something's changing. It doesn't change till you reach the burn. Does everybody get it? It's the same thing spiritual. There's a place in the spirit where we reach a burn where there's change. Without reaching that burn, there's no change. Even though God puts you in a valley, you must reach a burn in the valley. Or you'll come out of that valley the same way you went in. There's got to be a burn for change. Everybody okay? Oh, happy days. <laughs> this is a faithful saying, verse 9, and worthy of all acceptance. For to this end we both labor and suffer. We both burn. Reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. These things command and do what? And teach. Oh, hallelujah. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. You know, and, and the Word tells us a little leaven leavens a whole lump. Amen? It's the little things that can cause a lot of problem. If God is constantly telling you something to stop, and you don't, you'll stay in that burn. You won't leave it until you stop it. Somebody get it? You know, it, it could be anything. Anything. It could be he's saying, look, at you're eating this piece of food that's killing you. Stop it. You're doing this that's killing you. Stop it. Your tongue is killing you and everyone else. Stop it. <laughs> there are certain things that he is constantly telling us. He does it in a gentle way. <laughs> Not the way I just expressed it. <laughs> well, sometimes. It depends your relationship with him. <laughs> Some of us need a slap in the back of the head, you know, kick in the butt. Stop it! <laughs> For I bury you alive. <laughs> but, but in that, you know, why? Because 
Rebellion brings the curse. The curse brings suffering to the burn. Again, we're always, we, we all, it, it will always be in some kind of a burn, but there's a level of a fiery burn, you know, flame of fire, and then there's the gentle burn. Where do you want to be? Do you want to repeat that same burn over and over and over? How about that sickness, same over and over and over? It, whatever it is. You know, sometimes God has to do things to get our attention. Burns should always get his attention. You know, I, my brother that passed away from cancer, and he saw the change in my life. And he was still, you know, he didn't get it currently. I mean, he came to the Lord and so forth, but when he called me and told me he had cancer, I said, does God have your attention? He said, yes. Well, he turned his life over to the Lord quick. You know, sometimes it's, don't get me wrong, it's too late. But the end result, maybe not healed, but he got healed when he went home. Amen. He, there could be a, you don't know when God's going to finally say, okay, I'm done warning you. Now the course is going to run, and I'm not going to answer you. But you keep repenting, and I'll see you when you get home. Look at how many people have died. People are dying left and right from the COVID and all the other stuff and what they're doing to their bodies and whatever. Is everybody okay? Romans 8.18, let's speak it. For I consider the suffering, the burns <laughs> of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So you see that burn, that suffering is going to expose the glory of God because we're going to reach a level to be partakers of his holiness. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Hallelujah. For the creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because of the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we are saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. How many of you know unforgiveness will bring a burn constantly? Bitterness. Gossip, slander, all of these things. And that burn will constantly, again, it's the level of the burn. Partakers of his holiness. In 1 Corinthians 13. Verse 1. Let's speak it. Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I have become sounding brass or clanging cymbal. That's where an individual is still holding grudges. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers, love suffers, love suffers, love suffers. I'm going to say that one more time. Love suffers. Oh, oh snap, it ain't short. Love suffers long. Amen? And is what? Kind. Whoa. Love does not what? Envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not what? Puffed up. Does not behave what? Rudely. Does not seek its own. It's not provoked. Thinks no evil. 
does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never what? Never fails. Love for suffering long. Why? Because in the burn, God is perfecting perfect love. Perfect love. God is love. How can we express God if there's not love? If there's not mercy, if there's not forgiveness. Amen? How can we express God's love in that area? Man, you'll stay in the burn until you burn. <laughs> Hallelujah. Jeremiah 33. There's another area that I want to just share quickly, which is the results of the burn. As believers, we need to be more sensitive, more detailed, and more discerning. So we have senses of the human nature, but there are senses of the spiritual nature. And I really believe that in this burn, God is activating and perfecting certain parts of our senses. And Jeremiah 33 and verse 1. Is everybody there? Oh, hallelujah, I'm coming there. Jeremiah 33 and verse 1. The first sense is sight. You know, sight's a sense. And verse 11, let's speak it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah a second time while he was still shut up in the court of the prison, saying, Thus says the Lord who made it, the Lord who formed it to establish it. The Lord is his name. Call me, and I will answer you and do what? Show you great and mighty things which you did not know. Show you. That's vision. That's vision. So what's he trying to do? He's trying to get us into a place where we see more. Somebody get it? Where we see more. How many of you know uh, yeah, that, that saying uh, a picture is worth a thousand words? Sometimes you just need to see it. And I've shared this testimony over and over. And, and, and I thank God to this day. When my daughter was just leaning on walls to walk. I was going into my garage. You know the garage door is very heavy. And I didn't know she was behind me. And I was shutting the garage door in her hands. Her fingers were in where the hinges was. And instantly I saw that. And, and she, I didn't know she was behind me. And I turned around and grabbed the door. I, I, I don't know how I would have felt if those little fingers came off. But they would have. And I caught that door just in time. And I thank the Lord so much for sight. And so many other things that he has protected me from or protected someone else from, from sight. Or prepared me if something had happened. He showed me. Don't freak out, guy. It's going to be taken care of. Okay. Does everybody understand? And I really believe that the fruits of the burn are to make us more... Act, make our senses more activated and sensitive to be able to see quicker, hear quicker, other things. If, if I would have been too dull then, my daughter's fingers would have been gone. Hello? Hallelujah. Let's go to, uh, so that's sight, perfecting sight. First Samuel chapter 3, verse 10. Now the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, speak for your servant is what? Hears. Mm. For your servant what? Hears. Hears. Remember, when you hear, you what? See. When you don't hear, you don't see. 
Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do something in Israel, at which both ears of everyone who hears it will what? Tingle. So when you've heard somebody say, Hey, ting your ears tingling. Somebody's talking about you. How about God is talking about you? And that day I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from the beginning to end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows. In other words, because his sons were sowing in the flesh. And now they're reaping the corruption. And so because Eli constantly refused to take care of it and remove them from their positions, who was their father, it was bringing the whole house of Israel down. And God was going to remove Eli. In fact, that's when the tabernacle of God was removed. It was stolen. God let it go. And then Samuel became the prophet. For I've told him that I will judge his house forever and the iniquity of which he knows because his sons made themselves vile and he did not restrain them. Does everybody see that? And therefore I swore to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. So he said, man, this isn't going to last forever because you ain't doing nothing about it. So Samuel lay down until the morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision. Then Eli called to Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He answered, here I am. And he said, what is the word <clears throat> that the Lord spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. God, so <clears throat> God do so to you. And more also, if you hide anything from me of all the things that he said to you. And then Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. See, Eli was basically blinded now. He couldn't see. And he was killed. Well, he actually then broke his neck. And the tabernacle was, I mean, the uh, covenant of the Lord was taken. So we see in here, hearing, you and I need to get to a place where we're hearing... <laughs> And God's going to bring us in a burn so that we can hear better. It's amazing that when we get in trouble, we become more sensitive to other things. <laughs> Second Corinthians 2. So we see sight, which is a sense. Hearing is a sense. Second Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Let's speak it. Everybody there? Now thanks be to God who always leads us into triumph. Is everybody there? In Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every what? Every place. So a smell. A sense. Yeah. For we are to God, the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, we are the aroma of death leading to death. And to the other, the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things. For we are not as so many peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity. But as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. The fragrance, we are the fragrance and sweet aroma of God. See, you and I can be more sensitive to smell. Heck, you can smell a demon. You can smell that presence. Psalm 119. Psalm 119, 97. Thank you, Master. Sight, hearing, smell. Let's speak it. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day long, my focus. You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the anxious because I keep your precepts. I restrain my feet from every evil way 
that I may keep your word. I have not departed from your judgments, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my what? To my what? Taste is, taste is a, 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 a sensitivity that we need to have. It's, it, isn't it? Does everybody get it? It's a spiritual sense. We need to taste the goodness of God, he says. But when we, when we partake of the word, the word of God should become food to you, should be tasteful to you. Amen? Tasting his words as food. Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. In verse 5. So I said, woe to me for I am undone because I am a man of what? Unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King and the Lord of hosts. The one a seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Let me tell you, there's a touch that you know. Look it. When you come into the fellowship in the presence of God, there's an area of touch. Some people are not sensitive to that touch yet. But that burn will bring you uh, to a place where you are more sensitive to the touch of God. Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sins purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be what? Healed. Healed. That's why there's delay in healing sometimes. Hello, to touch, being sensitive to his touch and to receiving his healing. And I'm going to close in Revelation 21. Those were the five senses, the results of the burn to become more sensitive. Revelation 21. Hallelujah. In verse 1. You know, think about where we, at, we are at right now in the world. What's going on globally. My goodness. Again, the world is in a burn. It has to. It's the only way it can change. Remember, judgment starts in the house of God first. Before it goes anywhere. So in this burn, there's an opportunity to partake of his holiness, become more sensitive to the senses, become more like him, carry his fragrance. In verse 1, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, there shall be no more pain, that means sickness and disease, and burn. <laughs> For the former things have passed away. And he, he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. 
and I'll give the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and they shall be my sons and daughters. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and the like, and, and all liars shall have their what? Part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. We see everything is coming to an end to begin anew. Amen? So the burn that God is bringing us into is to be partakers of Him. And to burn out everything else so we can receive the fullness that He has for us. Amen? Praise God. Father, we are honored and blessed. We thank you for your release of your word today and for your release of your prophetic word today. We continually await your direction that we may be sons and daughters that please you. Let the words that were released be sealed and protected to grow and bear fruit for your glory today. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Amen.